Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony de Nassau. Today, we have an extraordinary trailblazer as a guest, a superwoman in her own right, Nancy Conrad. Hi, Nancy. How are you and where are you? I'm fantastic, and I am now in Atlanta, Georgia. I just recently moved here from D.C., from Washington, D.C. Wow, how wonderful. I need to come and visit you. I have not been to Atlanta yet. Oh, well, I really haven't either. It's sort of been a good thing with the <laughs> pandemic. But, yeah. Very, very nice. Well, for, the, for our guests on YouTube who see us live, and for our guests on all of these different podcast channels, let me introduce to you Nancy Conrad. Her bio is extraordinary. Her life has and is extraordinary in all its facets. And I'm actually really excited about this talk. So let me introduce Nancy to you now. Nancy Conrad, a former teacher, Nancy has become a recognized leader in transformative education and named one of the top 100 leaders in STEM education, so science, technology, engineering, and math, serving as a featured speaker at national and international conferences. Her presentations include TED, MIT, and the Global Competitiveness Forum in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. She also presented at the Global Diversity Leadership Conference at Harvard University and the National Modeling and Simulation Coalition Conference in Washington, DC. Nancy has also testified before the US House of Representatives Committee on Science, Space and Technology, detailing how the Conrad Foundation exemplifies the use of partnership to improve STEM education. She is the wife of late astronaut Pete Conrad, who during the Apollo 12 mission became the third man to walk on the moon. Hello, Nancy. Wow, what a bio. It is a great honor to speak to you. Thank you. It's been quite a life. That's all I can say. Quite a <laughs> right. By the way, Pete may have been the third guy to walk on the moon. He was the first to dance on it. <laughs> so if you look at some of the... Uh, there's very little footage from the Apollo 12 mission because the camera got broken, unfortunately. But they were singing and dancing the whole time that they were there. Three best friends on their ultimate adventure together uh, into space. And their landing site was the Ocean of Storms, a little different than Neil and Buzz on the Sea of Tranquility. And we didn't know at the time, but the Ocean of Storms was prophetic because Pete's flight, his Saturn V rocket, that struck by lightning uh, right after launch it was the first and the last time just that that NASA launched in foul weather. So that didn't happen anymore. So it was it was an interesting ride. They had a great great adventure in space and took science to the moon. Um, magnetometers, seismometers. They they found out that the uh, moon is actually like a like a uh, thermos bottle. It has a solid outside and then an air piece and then a center core. And they found that out by the mag magnetometers that were used when they left the surface of the moon. So it was, it was a heck of a journey. They had a wonderful time. They brought back a lot of moon rocks and an amazing uh, technology that was at that time, just way beyond anything we had ever thought about before. And you have to think about one thing, you know, Neil and Buzz, went to the moon in July. Pete and Al and Dick went in November. Mm. Look at the time frame of that. It was extraordinary. So that was back in the good old swashbuckling days of the early days of the lunar missions and the space program. And look where we are today. Holy Christmas. You know, I look at the little landing module that Pete was on was about that big. And the one that's going to go up now on Artemis that SpaceX is about that big. So 33 feet as opposed to about 320 feet. I, I can't tell you exactly if that's the dimension. But big. that's a much nicer <laughs> landing vehicle than the little guy that Pete and Alvin landed on in the moon in 1969. Wow. 
Yeah. That is extraordinary for all of our space geeks listening and, and looking at this video. They must be buzzing, 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 because I surely am. This is extraordinary. Also to hear all of these stories and to have all of these artifacts probably at home as well. And, and, and just, the you know. Artifact, the artifacts are all uh, at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. There's a very large exhibit there. And it's quite different because when I when I took Pete's collection to the museum, um, I said, you know, I don't want to do space stuff with little titles. Let's tell the story about the people who went. And so that has really laid the framework for the way the museum in Seattle exhibits all of their space material. And, and that has grown into a very nice and very large exhibit of uh, uh, space memorabilia. And in fact, I helped uh, Jeff Bezos and his mom, they were out in the ocean looking for the engines for Apollo 11 and 12. And I just happened to know the guy that knew where everything was. And so the engine from Apollo 12 is also at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. So it's a very, very extraordinary exhibit. If anybody's in Seattle, go see it. It's super cool. Wow, absolutely. That's incredible. Well, Nancy, this is beautiful and thank you for sharing um, the work and some of the anecdotes of your, your late husband, Pete Conrad. Let's get to you because you are a superwoman in your own right. You have with honor taken on um, the challenge to create a legacy for your late husband. It's called the Conrad Challenge. Right. Tell us about that. Well, you have to go into the why because there's two whys. First why is that Pete was a kid that uh, had a problem reading and spelling. And back in the day, they didn't know what dyslexia was and they thought he was stupid. Mm -hmm. And they expelled him from a very prestigious school. And we uh, ended up in a little boarding school. His mom found a school that was known to um, be really excellent with students that had these sorts of issues and still is. So he, he learned how to fly and that was his passion. And he soloed when he was 16 years old. And when he got to this school, um, they had mastered there, saw something special in Pete. And he took him under his wing and Pete ended up with a scholarship to Princeton his compliments to the Navy and Princeton. Now, this is a kid who's expelled, mind you. Mm -hmm. Educator takes him under his wing. He gets to go to Princeton. He becomes an aeronautical engineer. Well, he loved to fly, and he didn't have to read or spell. So then when he graduated university, he became a test pilot. And when Kennedy wanted some guys to go to the moon, he liked to fly. He ended up actually with four flights in space, Apollo 12 was his third flight. And then he flew Skylab our first space station, damaged at launch. He rescued the lab. For that, he was awarded a Congressional Space Medal of Honor, and then went on to work in the aerospace industry. And toward the end of his life, he was creating really the whole framework and infrastructure for the privatization and commercialization of space. And unfortunately, it'll be 22 years on July 8th that he was killed in an accident. I'm sorry. So when you look at that story, you look at a young man, an educator takes him under his wing, and that kid gets a moonshot. And so about five years after Pete was killed, I came up for air and I thought, you know, I'm a teacher. And my whole life has been dedicated to bringing what I call whole education. We don't push things at kids with tests and we invite them to be part of their learning experience and to be part of designing the future. And we do that by inviting them to create commercially viable products to solve big global challenges or also local challenges. And the kids work in categories, aerospace, energy, cyber, and health, which is really the whole world. And it's there to one, honor Pete's legacy you know, he got a moonshot because an educator took him under his wing. So we take kids under our wing and give them their moonshot. And their moonshot is, is being part of designing the future and becoming part 
of a global network of young innovators and entrepreneurs. And all of this is built on Pete's legacy of education, innovation, and entrepreneurship. So we've built over the last, we're in our 15th year. <laughs> and it's amazing to me. Um, so we have a global network of young people that have stayed together, continue to be together. We have a very large alumni network. And it's not a numbers game for us. This is a very personal interaction with these young people. And it's very supportive of them. And it's a community of kids worldwide that have done this competition by the way they own their product ideas. Some of them get full patents and can apply for that through our competition. It's not about dropping out of schools and making companies and websites. That's not what we do. We grow a whole community of young agile thinkers who can pivot, who understand how to think, how to learn. You know, we don't know what the workforce is gonna look like in five years, but if you have a whole bunch of young people that understand the process of design thinking, meet systems thinking, which is really what they're asked to do and can pivot and are agile thinkers, these kids can do anything. So whatever the world looks like in five years, they're ready. They can be part of the workforce because they understand process. They understand thinking and learning. And so it's been an extraordinary experience. Um, we host an, it's difficult by the way, it's a funneled competition. It will launch again in August and the kids write business plans, market studies, Prototypes could be a, a visual representation. And we now select. What is the age group, Nancy? 13 to 18. So Pete got his moonshot in high school. I'm a high school teacher. It made sense to do high school. And it's, high school has been sort of a wasteland in terms of special opportunities for kids. So we have ended up and we're one of the top credentials for college admission. We become part of their uh, online digital portfolios. And, you know, when you look at the work and it literally is from, from Australia to Zimbabwe and the kids found us. And by the way, they work in teams. There's two to five in a team. It was very intentional. You know, we guys went to the moon in teams, businesses, teamwork. So in that comes leadership skills, collaboration skills, cooperation skills, mm -hmm. and communication skills. It's a funneled competition. The kids form their teams. They uh, pick their category and they have a coach. Now the coach is an adult. It could be a parent, could be a teacher, could be an after school program, could be a business leader, could be a university student. It must be an adult. And they come into our uh, or, you know, into our website. And they're given tools and resources to understand how to do innovation and entrepreneurship. We don't tell them what to make. We don't tell them what they wanna do. It's not make this and if you make it better, you win. It's, hey, here's all the challenges facing the world today. Figure out a solution. And they blow your mind. Mm -hmm. So, all those tools and resources are, are available to the kids that come into our competition. We will be announcing a, a transition of all those resources onto an, another platform that has a very large, massive 250,000 person teacher and student audience. And that will happen in August as well. They, our alumni host workshops for the kids so they understand how to find their superpowers uh, how to pitch, how to write a business plan, how to do a market study. Um, and so all of that is available to the kids. When they go through the funnel, there's a backside to it. There's a rubric with very highly qualified judges and subject matter experts. And by the way, those subject matter experts are available to the kids during the course of the competition. We down select and five teams per category are invited to our innovation summit. So to explain that to you is sort of think Shark Tank meets the Academy Awards for kids. I mean, it's super mm -hmm. cool. Wow. We've been at Kennedy Space Center for many years. I don't know where this year's summit will be yet. We've had to do virtual summit for a couple of years, obviously, 
but due to the pandemic. And the kids pitch in real time in front of judges. And whether it's virtual or in person, that's what it looks like. And that is really where the community becomes very intercepted, very integrated. Um, and these kids stay with us year over year, over year, over year. Some of them now are venture capitalists. Some of them got the space bug. They're working in satellite companies. Mm -hmm. Some have patents. Some are at large companies like Google and, and uh, some of the aerospace companies. And we really have built an innovative workforce to sustain our knowledge economy. And that makes me very proud and very happy. So um, as they would say in, in the space business, that was a successful launch. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that sounds incredible. Yeah, I need to look into that for my children as well. Both of them are extremely dyslexic. And ah. then say that, um, that at the time they were saying that children with dyslexia are being seen as dumb. That hasn't changed. That is still the case. My both my children, especially my oldest, he was very bullied when he was in school, yeah. and he was really sad about it. He's also very curious, builds his robots, and does all of these other things he does. But yes, it's true that reading is definitely not a strength of theirs. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I will look into that because my youngest Noah, Noah who is thirteen now, yeah. will be fourteen in a few months' time. He wants to create his own business. I want okay. to do an MBA for children, but I think this could be actually really cool. Are you doing something like summer schools as well, like a summer um, program? So it's, it's really interesting because a lot of these kids will start forming teams over the summer. Um, they start looking at our competition. They start to put their teams together, their ideas together. And then when we launch in August, as, as Pete would say, spring loaded in the ready position. So they're at the ready and it just puts them a little bit ahead of what's happening. Probably next year, I'm hopeful that we will start doing some boot camps. I think we're going to be doing a hackathon this summer that the alumni will host and that's being shaped now. So, so watch our website because everything happens on there. And then we do a lot of social media posting as well on you know all the sites. And so that's all coming along as well. But, it, you know, it, it's perfect for kids like your kids, it, you know, and it was interesting. While Pete was dyslexic and he couldn't read very well, he had a photographic memory. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinary. So he was a great uh, expert witness for aircraft accidents. I mean, go figure that out. Um, and, and many other things that he got to do because of this tremendous capacity. He had. And and I think any of the Apollo guys, not many are still alive, um, four are still alive. They would all tell you that Pete Conrad was the best seat of the pants pilot of all of them. He just intuitively knew, and that cockpit was his sanctuary. It was where he was at peace and the bullies didn't bother him. So he also had that scenario. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, his cockpit, he, he felt the rocket. It's a, and you know, I have a theory about it. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but, but flying was so intuitive to him. It was a system and he, you know, was checklist and doing things in a certain order. And I think when he got to this little school that he went to, my belief, and I'll never know if this is true, but I believe that he began to apply the system from learning to fly to the system from lear to learning to learn. So it was that same thing, checklist, going down and understanding piece by piece by piece what you needed to understand to start the, the engine, to be, get into the air. I don't know, I think that piece plus someone believing in him, this headmaster had confidence in Pete and took him under his wing. And we all need someone to take us under their wing. I've been blessed to have incredible human beings that have encouraged me personally mm -hmm. and have been at my side as I jump off of things going, oh, we're gonna make this happen. And they go, ha ah, yeah, right. I'm a vision person, Tessie. I am not a process person. And I'm so blessed to have process people around me that help 
these visions come to life. So that I can't do this by myself. I have a tremendous team that works with us in the operations side that, that makes all this happen. Yeah, it, I'm very, very lucky with that. Teamwork makes the dream work, as they say, huh? Yes, very good quote. You're absolutely spot on with that. <laughs> so, my dear Nancy, um, we are running out of time already. It's amazing. Time oh, flies yeah. on Zoom o'clock. It always does. I make sure um, for people listening for the social media parts, it is sure. it is the Conrad Challenge when they... Con when Conradchallenge.org and kids start signing up. As I've said, over the summer, they start working on these things. It also gives them entree into a lot of the things that the alumni are doing, things that we will post over the summer. And um, it's an opportunity to start thinking about what category do you want to be in? Let me just share a couple of things that kids have done. And mm -hmm. really so one of our teams out of New Hampshire uh, just got patented. They uh, created a way to put out forest fires mm -hmm. using sound sound to put out fires holy smoly we've got kids that have created water purification systems low cost portable all they're in nine countries primarily developing countries so they're in a birthing clinic in in, uh, in the congo so babies there used to be washed in dirty water coming out of the womb and because of these kids they're washed in clean water wow uh, it's just all over the place and it's in our website and you can go see some of these amazing things that these kids have come up with they've taken styrofoam which isn't degradable degraded it into carbon crystals for water purification wow. i mean it, it and because we don't say make this and if you make it better you win they're all over the place and some of these innovations are just so extraordinary um we also help the kids understand the patent process. And all of the kids that come to Summit have provisional patents. We work with the patent office, uh, the USPTO, which is a global organization, by the way. So okay. it's cool, it's fun. It helps the kids find what I call their cool ability, their superpowers, and kids have superpowers. Sometimes they're not able to express those in the classroom because it's a lot of what I call push education, which is tests and you know this is what you're going to learn today this is how you're going to learn it one thing i want to share with you quickly is in the pandemic we were really like oh my gosh do we even do anything because there was no framework no scaffold 49 countries and 33 states came into the competition this past year wow without that's... school one of our teachers had 20 teams she'd never met the students and the students had never met each other the other thing is kids can collaborate across countries, cities, states, socioeconomic levels, genders. The internet is like standing on the moon. Pete saw a little blue and white marble floating in a black velvet sky without borders or boundaries. That's what the internet is. And we're working with Gen Z. They've grown up on the internet. That's the same way they see the world. So it's uniquely suited to our uh, particular group of young people that we work with, yeah. Wow, that is the perfect ending to the Zoom o'clock. What a beautiful, yeah, picture you have drawn into my mind. Um, quite emotional as well. It's really, really beautiful. I will it's definitely get my boys right now. It's so great because this is where education can start to become diplomacy. Kids that know each other from around the world, you know, kids don't make wars. No, no, and they, they, you know, for them, everyone can be a friend. You know, they, they exactly. see through all of these shallow lines that, uh, that kind of become stronger when you become older and you're being influenced by right. well, things that don't really matter so much. Right. And you know, you keep the network that you've grown from around the world. Hey, peace could break out. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> a force, a force for peace for the common. Exactly. exactly. Well, thank you, my dear Nancy. For thank everyone you. listening and looking at this video, please make sure to go and look up the Conrad Challenge. 
Um, it's really fantastic. I looked at the website. I would my, make my kids look at it as well and see what they can do. Um, for everyone else, please also comment on this podcast. We would love to hear your feedback and I will share it with Nancy. You can get in touch as well with Nancy through their website. Uh, if you have further questions, if you are an educational institution who wants to be part of this, uh, if you are a sponsor, because all of that needs funding too. I know Nancy didn't mention it, but it is true. Everything needs funding. And what can be more important than the future of our leaders, of our little leaders, the leaders of tomorrow, their education. So please do also see how you can make a difference because everyone has a piece of puzzle to add to the main picture. So thank you, my dear Nancy. I really appreciated your time. I know you're very busy and uh, we keep talking offline. I will see you hopefully in the UK soon when you are on the continent and for the rest, all the best. And um, yeah, until we speak again. Thank you. Thank you.